Do you want to do you want to do the beginning? Sure. Welcome everybody to well, what is today March 15th of 2021 and this is our hmm, 22nd episode of uh, what is now Monday equals MC squared. So welcome and we're going to continue today with a discussion about nutrients and supplements and how those can interact with your medications or over-the-counter drugs that you might be familiar with and how those can impact your long-term health as well as the nutrient status of your body. We're going to get a little bit more into that today. Um, but to get started, why don't we just begin with settling in? This is always an important thing to do. We all have been running around probably even if we're not going anywhere from our houses. We have that ability. And so for those of us out in this area of the country, we just got dumped on with several feet of snow. So we've spent uh, the last few hours digging out and uh, it's good to have a little rest from that too. So let's just slow down and pause. And if you, if you would like to close your eyes, if that feels good to you, go ahead and do that. And I'm just going to say, as we're settling in here, how important it is to take moments like this periodically throughout each day to become still and to slow down your breathing, consciously connect it by breathing through your nose. And I'll repeat a couple of things that we've said before on these calls is that this is a great opportunity for you to practice functional breathing. Okay, functional breathing. And what that means is breathing about five to six seconds on your inhale through your nose. And then exhaling through your nose for five to six seconds. Let's just continue that pattern for a couple more breaths because this is what prepares your body to do all of the metabolic work that it has to do every day, every moment of every day. So five to six seconds on your inhale, just slow it down. Don't force it, just sip it in. And then five to six seconds through your nose on the exhale. Let's do one more. Slowing it down, five to six seconds, inhaling through the nose. And five to six seconds exhaling through the nose. And once you feel settled, focused, present, ready to engage, if your eyes are closed, go ahead and open them. And if they're not closed, just become aware of the space around you and let's all come on back. All right. Well, thanks, Chris. That was really nice. It's, um, it's very calming. It's been a crazy morning, hasn't it? Yes, it has. It took hours to dig out this morning. So um, um, just wanted to give a shout out to Steve, our good friend Steve that is on this call too, came to help us dig ourselves out with his snowblower too. And uh, it was uh, kind of crazy. Took, took you guys three hours to do it and it took us an hour and we couldn't even get out. So, but we're it's blue skies and it's starting to warm up already so yeah. all right so i think somebody's not muted so i don't know you can find that person Chris. Yep. so let's yeah and let's go ahead and start with uh 
jumping into the topic that we were going to touch on today, which was we're going to wind up just a little bit, backtrack to a really important topic. Did you want to pick it up from there? Yeah, sure. Let's start with the statistics too. And then the new, you know, new studies, not studies, but the field of study that is coming out, you know, uh, we briefly mentioned that too. So we got started on this topic, which is a giant topic, right? That um, what are nutrients that are getting depleted, key nutrients are getting depleted based on you taking your pharmaceutical drugs. And, you know, just a disclaimer, right? That we're not doctors, we're functional nutritional therapists, among other things, that we cannot tell you to whether you should take the a medication or not. And to, you know, if you want to come off of the medications, that decision will have to be made on your own. And, you know, I would definitely discuss that with your doctor. And, you know, we do help clients to get off of the pharmaceutical drugs, but that will, that decision will have to be made individually and you will have to set up appointments with us to do that kind of a thing. So, you know, just to give you a heads up, not to ask the question, like, should I get off of X, Y, and Z? Those questions we cannot legally answer in the public forum. So please um, know that. And just wanted to give you, you know, statistics that we shared last week, the as many as 73%, I would say even more than that of um, age 55 and 64. So that percentage goes up if you're 65 and up. The on average 55 and 64, we take one to two prescriptions drugs. And if you're older than that, the average goes up to four prescription drugs. And the key point is that each prescription drug will have its own list of side effects, right? There's no such thing as you taking pharmaceutical drugs and not have side effects from it, okay? There will always be some kind of a side effects. It could be small, you may not notice it, but the liver still has to process it, right? Liver will do its very best to process your drugs your caffeine, sugar, alcohol, cigarette smokes, and heavy metals and toxins and so on and so forth. But the uh, pharmaceutical drugs are toxic, okay? So that has to get processed by the liver. But the problem is that we don't know what these four drugs, let's say, combination of those four drugs are doing to your body in terms of what side effects, because no one has ever done this study and I don't know if you can do a study like this because what four combinations of drugs are we talking about? It's so different from person to person. So um, there's never been a study done. So that's something to keep in mind that maybe you, you're experiencing some things that are a combination of these cocktails of drugs that are causing you to have different side effects. And we don't exactly know what they're doing. So that's where we talked about last week and we went into stomach acid, the importance of stomach acid and the um, what minerals and nutrients and vitamins get depleted when you start to take uh, PPIs. So PPIs are the stomach acid, uh, the acid blockers and um, drugs that, that you can take over the counter that will lower your stomach acid production as well. So just to, you know, go over that a little bit. When you don't take enough stomach acid, you're not going to be digesting foods well. If you don't digest foods well, then you're going to deplete yourself of all kinds of minerals and nutrients. And that includes anything from calcium to magnesium, to zinc, to potassium, to you name it. Okay. Almost just about everything. But what we see often is B12 deficiency is big. B1, but particularly all across the B vitamins. So those are some of the things to keep in mind. And if your blood test constantly shows that you have low vitamin D, that's something you may want to pay attention to. It's like, what, what's going on with my stomach acid? Am I digesting enough? Have I been on antiacids for a long time? If so, you need to look at that and maybe have a, you know, serious discussion with your doctor that's 
prescribe that. Or if you're just buying it over the counter, you need to look at why am I needing that? How come I can't digest? Okay. So I'll pause here for a moment. Chris, you want to chime in with anything? Yeah, I, I'm thinking this might be a good time to start talking about some of the backdrop to this situation that we're finding ourselves in. And a big part of that, I want to just back up from symptoms. That's how we've been trained to start, is to look at symptoms and then try to find out, okay, what is the medicine or if you are less inclined to do the conventional allopathic medicine and you like alternative uh, medicines and, and practices, you might look at a supplement or an oil or something like that, a, a, an essential oil, or even you know a certain frequency to help with the symptom, but it's still the same thinking, how to get rid of the symptoms. And the whole approach that we are talking about in everything that we do is how to get at the causes, the, the root conditions that are leading to these problems in the first place. And so if we just back up a little bit, I want people, just everybody think for a moment about food packaging labels. And if you haven't really looked closely at one of these, I'm not even going to really get into the ingredients aspect of it right now, but I want you to just think about a label that you've looked at recently, or if you haven't, next time you look at one, check this look to the very bottom of the label and see how much you can find that contains vitamin or mineral content. A lot of times what you'll find is that only things like vitamin C and iron are mentioned on packaging. A lot of times, if you look at it, it's zero. And so what happens is we have a society that we live in where our nutritional knowledge is very, very limited collectively. And so what that ends, ends up uh, causing here is that when we start to talk about these things, people only look at a, a few things. They talk about calories, they talk about macronutrients like fats, proteins, and carbohydrates, but most people know next to nothing about the micronutrients, okay? Micronutrients are the vitamins, which Masami has already started to talk about in the minerals. And then also some of the plant nutrients, the phytonutrients that you get from eating fresh or lightly cooked vegetables. So there are several steps that are getting us into this situation where we have so many people that are seemingly in need of medications or that take mega doses of supplements just to get by on a daily basis. And so what we need to be understanding here and what we need to be aware of is how we got into this situation, first of all, and then how can we come back to um, a balanced way of living, even in the conditions that we live in today. And I just saw that there was a chat question that popped up about labels I'm referring to. I'm talking about your basic food labels that you would buy um, like at the store on packaging um, especially processed food. I'm going to make one more comment and then I'll hand it over to Masami again for a minute. But when you look at processed foods, anything that's in a package, basically what happens is every time a food is processed and that could be even taking meat and grinding it up, that's a kind of processing. That's a very low level of processing. But anytime you apply a, a mechanical process, heat, chemical process, it depletes some of the nutrients. So the more steps of, of processing that are involved in the production of a food, and that includes what we do at home, but especially things that are commercially produced, the more steps that there are, the less of the original nutrients are going to enter your body when you eat it. So that's why highly, highly refined processed foods, and here you want to think about things like fast food and um, anything that you can order in a restaurant for the most part are going to be much lower in terms of their nutrient content. And that's going to lead to long-term deficits in your body, which are also going to lead to other conditions that we start to recognize later as symptoms and eventually diseases. So I wanted to just put that little piece of context there. And uh, do you want me to say more about the, do you want to get into the soil? Do you want to 
mention that piece? Um, let's, yeah, I was going to go into the soil and then maybe let's pick um, what antibiotics will do to in terms of a nutritional depletion. And then I wanted to go over some other medications too today. Um, but can you mention briefly about the new field of study yeah. that is starting to come out, which is super new. So we don't have a lot of information. Yeah, on there, it. I'm going to talk about two of them actually, and they're, they're very closely related. The one is, is on the biology side and it's being called nutrient genomics. Okay. Nutrient genomics. And what that has to do with is looking at the interactions between the foods that you eat, the, the individual nutrients and the foods that you eat and how those affect the signaling of your genes. So the on off switching of your gene expression. And this goes for everything in our bodies. I mean, everything from what we need to survive and be healthy. And it also includes things like cancers and other disease conditions that could be getting turned on either because of too much of something or not enough of something. So nutri nutrient genomics is looking at that set of relationships and then there's also a whole other branch that's starting to open up that's being called nutritional psychiatry. Very similar, except now you have psychiatrists who are medically trained psychologists and they're looking at how people eat, which is what we do in our most basic function. That's what functional nutritional therapy is about, but it's looking at how people eat and how those deficiencies or those patterns lead to psychiatric issues. So there's a lot more interest that's starting to come up these days because we know without question that there is such a huge connection between the foods that we eat, the quality of the nutrients in those foods and everything to do with our health from physical health to mental health and, and beyond, everything to do with that. So I'll, I'll stop there for now. Okay, so I think why don't we, I was going to talk about the soil mineral depletion, but let's start with maybe antibiotics and what depletes that. I mean, that seems like endless list. It's such a giant list. Um, and including myself, I don't think, you know, if you've never taken antibiotics, I would love to meet that person because I'd like to see how healthy of a person you can be if you don't take antibiotics. So I've taken them. Um, but it's been decades, you know, since I, I have taken antibiotics. So, but if you have been taking them in recent years, the antibiotics actually goes to the same category of drugs as chemotherapy drugs. So I need you to be really, really aware of it, that when a doc doctor prescribes you with antibiotics, you do want to stop and kind of think about it and understand what that will do to your body. Because antibiotics are, like I said, it's the same category as, as, as um, taking oral um, based chemotherapy drugs. Okay, so what antibiotics does is that in, in general, they, I call it carpet bombing of the gut. So when you take them, it is gonna indiscriminately kill good, bad, and ugly all across your entire small intestinal gut lining. It will irritate the epithelial lining. Um, it will definitely change the culture, the environment of your intestinal environment, small intestine to large intestine to so, you know, even into skin, to your gut, to everything else. So it's not something that you want to indiscriminately take right? And um, did you say something here? Antibiotics are in the same class of chemo drugs because they impact your entire system globally. Okay. Thank you. Um, so when you take them, um, you might say to me, oh, I, I took that like three weeks ago. Well, the fact is the impact of the antibiotics will have on your body that will last you anywhere from I would say six months is too short, but it'll last. Some studies have shown that it'll last up to six years. So one course of antibiotics will impact your gut lining, gut environment, the whole system for up to six years. Okay. So, it, you know, some doctors are getting 
smarter and they're saying, hey, you need to take probiotics. But for me, that seems like here, here's your, you know, we've did this and these are the, you know, we've burned down your whole entire field of microbes. And now we'll give you a couple trees to plant back into it. You know, um, I suppose that could help, sure, but that's going to take some time to rebuild your gut lining, okay? And I'm just going to list some of the things that you are going to be missing in terms of nutrients, vitamins and minerals and such when you take antibiotics. So obviously, you're going to be missing some of the bifidobacteria, lactobacillus, and biotin, potassium, all Bs, so B1, B2, B3, B6, B12, vitamin C, E, K, because that's going to impact your lower gut. So fat soluble vitamins as well, inositol, uh, magnesium, zinc, um, the list kind of goes on. So it's an altercation of your entire body. And I think that's what you really have to remember. And if you feel like you have to take the antibiotics because you have to do some surgery. You, you know, you really want to look at this carefully and say, how can I create better environment before I go into the surgery? And then during, you know, right after the surgery and as the antibiotics, the doctor starts to give you, how do I balance that? Not only taking more probiotics, but you may need to take things to support your gut lining. You may need to actually start to eat better, much better than before, start to do things that are anti-inflammatory, um, prolytic enzyme. Enzymes are great. Other different enzymes are great. Um, healing, gut healing kind of enzymes will be necessary. So, you know, I guess we can't tell you not to do it. Um, I have been you know, I've had surgeries done and I have actually opted not to take antibiotics. And then, you know, doctors and nurses have made me feel really badly. Um, but I say to them, I said, you can write the prescription and it is on me. And you can even write that note on there because I am making my own decision this way. Um, so it doesn't come back on them and they, they're fine with that, but be very, very like, you're ready. You're ready to give yourself what the body's going to deplete by doing that. So don't, you know, my, my caution is please don't be so quick to take antibiotics for just about anything. And I think we're creating a, a total mess in the world, in the body. So anything to add, Chris? I want to add the image to think about this in context is that just like a healthy ecosystem. So you think about a forest, the rainforest, something like that. The reason that those ecosystems can thrive and be healthy is because of the biodiversity. And our guts are just like that. So the more balanced diversity that we have, oftentimes the more healthy gene expression we have. And so the image I wanted to leave you with is if you've ever, maybe you've seen this type of image before, but it's a side by side of somewhere like in Borneo, where the rainforest has been cleared to make um, oil palm plantations just for hundreds of miles at a time. And you can see that the borderline on one side, you have the very straight lines of the oil palm trees one crop and then next to it where the forest is is all of the biodiversity the hundreds or thousands of different species next to each other and that's kind of what happens when we do the antibiotics is like masami said they are indiscriminate so you don't really you don't take antibiotics and then target only one species of bacteria that you don't want you end up killing everything and like Masami said, it can take years to recover. But the fact is, when you, when you take antibiotics, you permanently alter your microbiome in your gut. And you, you don't ever fully build it back to what it was before you took those antibiotics. So if you've been somebody taking them regularly, I'm not saying this to scare anybody, 
but it changes the expression of other areas of your body because these bacteria are not only responsible for um, producing enzymes that help signal your cells and tell them how to, how to function, but they also produce nutrients, they produce hormones, they produce signaling chemicals that help our bodies to do what they need to do. And we need to have this, this healthy balance between the fungus, the yeast, the bacteria, the viruses. We need all of those things in order to have this human experience. And I know um, some of you may have heard Masami say this recently, but if you were to take all of the genetic material, I, we've said this before on one of these calls too, but if you were to take all of the genetic material of, of your entire physical being, your whole body, and if you were redu to reduce all of the DNA into human and non-human, I'm just curious if anybody knows this, if you wanna just type it into the chat, what percentage of the entire DNA in your physical body, inside and out, is what we, what we could call human DNA? Does anybody know that? Percentage? Cheryl's been listening to me very carefully. I okay, think. so Cheryl says 10%. <laughs> and the 10% number, Cheryl, is a, is a good one. Um, that's what I said. 10% is the number of human cells. But if we're looking at DNA, um, I'm going to type in the number in the chat because I want you to see this. I want to blow your minds a little bit with this number because it's crazy. Okay, ready? That's the number of, that's the percentage of DNA. You need to is, say it. That is non human 99.7% of the DNA inside and outside on our skin is what we, what we would call non-human, meaning it comes from bacteria, viruses, yeasts, fungus, and other kinds of um, like protozoa and other microbial things. So our human DNA is actually a very small component of the whole mix. This means that we, we are dependent we, we are interdependent on these other species, these other microbes. We need them in order to, to be healthy. And so much of the bacterial function in our bodies is about uh, producing enzymes. I, I once heard it said by a doctor that if our bodies stopped having enzymes available to them, even for just a split second, we would die. That's how absolutely essential they are because enzymes are catalysts and they're signalers and they're movers and they're telling our bodies how to do things, when to do things, how much, and they're helping to carry all these signals across. And the bacteria are a huge component to have that kind of signaling happen. So that was a little bit of a, a tangent from what we were talking about, but it's important to know this. So do you want to, do you want to, um, um, I wanted to, you know, um, it was an earlier question, like, what are the alternatives to, you know, antibiotics? And then um, Melinda answered really, really well. So she says, I use inner defense, which has oregano, thyme, lemon, grass, clove, lemon, eucalyptus, um, ra ra rhodiola, ro rhodiola, probably rosemary and cinnamon. Um, those are great. And then olive leaves are great. Um, you know, any kind of like a bitter herbs kind of things are great. All, all kinds of herbs are great. You know, eating right is great. And um, so these, these are great list of things. You know, I, my go-to is definitely oregano oil um, and olive leaves. But the issue is I was working with a client, I think a, a week ago, no, maybe a month ago, maybe I can't remember, but she was taking these kind of things every single day. And I asked her, I said, so why are you taking like, you know, oregano oil every single day? And how long have you been taking this? And I believe she said like three years, she's been taking it every single day. Um. And so you could kind of hear where I'm going with this, right? It, that's a natural antibiotics, but would you want to be taking antibiotics for three straight years? No. So for me, you have to also be careful not to take these things every single day of your 
worked for you um, be, when you had infections or if you had some kind of issues? And her answer was that because her, you know, somebody recommended that she, sh she should do this because she had like a SIBO or maybe some kind of a fungal overgrowth or something like that. So she decided to take it and she's been taking it every day. That is completely not the way to do it. You want to concentrate that for a while and then you come off of it and then you introduce probiotics, eat well throughout the whole time, then reintroduce it again, take a break again, and then you do probiotics for a while. You do that back and forth for a while, then you can finally, you know, let go of doing those things too. So please, you know, don't get in your head the just because it was great one time doesn't mean every day is good, let alone three years of every day doing oregano is going to be good for you. It doesn't work like that. It, not, you can't be heavy metal chelating every single day either. And that's another thing I see a lot in clients too, is that they put themselves on a heavy metal chelation protocol and they've been doing that for years while their body is totally stripped down, you know? So it's a balance. You, you, uh, we take more of an approach. Chris and I take an approach of how do we, feed the body? How do we get the body to be nourished so that the body can do its job to detox you? That's what we're a little bit more interested in. Okay. Um, I just wanted, I wanted to make one note about just to clarify the terms we're using here. When we say oregano oil, there's a safety issue involved that you need to be aware of. We're not saying go out and pop a bunch of oregano oil, because if you take a, a liquid form of oregano oil, you could actually do damage to your intestinal lining. Oregano oil is very, very powerful. And so the form that, if you're going to use it, do not take a liquid form. That's not recommended. And if people are doing that on a regular basis, what they're doing is they're essentially burning chemically. They're burning the lining of their small intestine, which is very sensitive to begin with. Yeah, so, and we don't we don't use the oil capsules at all with the yeah, oregano. There's, and for those of you that didn't work, maybe you did that. Yeah, so, I'm I'm going to just yeah. write a form. But again, um, I, back to what what you're saying, I just want to just piggyback on that really quickly. Is that it's important to take an approach that is instead of zapping the things that are coming up. This takes some work. This takes some some practice to develop this mindset but it's developing the, the approach that I'm building myself from the foundation up and it's slow work. So people that are having persistent symptoms that don't seem to go away when you change one little thing, that's not surprising. What we have to look at is how do we build the foundation of our entire body? And one of the things that we're saying really specifically here right now is that most of us Statistically speaking, almost all of us are already deficient in minerals, for sure, and vitamins. And uh, do you want me to talk for a minute about the soils just as we're, so we can then jump back to the... Uh-huh, okay. sure. Okay, so just I'm just going to take a, a sidetrack on this for a couple of minutes. But we have known in this country, and, and there's also an ongoing study in the UK that they've been doing for close to 100 years now, but we've known for the better part of a century that our agricultural soils are low and getting depleted faster in the mineral content. And so in the US, there was actually a hearing held in Congress 85 years ago in 1936 where there is a panel of um, people that were connected to the agriculture industry. And they're finding that a lot of the livestock throughout the country was experiencing spontaneous abortions of their, of their young. And that's pretty disturbing when that starts to happen. And what happened as a result of that is there was a commission that was ordered and they started to research the problem and what they found is that these livestock animals were depleted in basic minerals, things like calcium, magnesium, okay, iron, copper, some of these things that we absolutely need for our bodies to function are not being returned to the soil. So the big fertilizers that most um, large farms use are things like potassium 
and um, uh, phosphate. Those are big ones. Phosphorus-based um, uh, kinds of, of uh, fertilizers. And those, we, do, we can't really do much with those. They're bio unavailable to us. So what this means is we're not giving the soil a rest. Okay, that's one thing is we're not giving it a break. We might rotate crops, but it just goes corn and then soybeans and then corn again. No fallow time, no rest. We're not using um, organic fertilizers like manure as was done traditionally that contained a lot of this mineral content. Okay, it's the wastes from the animals. So that's not getting returned to the soil. So it's not going into the ground and we're not getting it. And then there's one other complicating factor that's come about since the 70s in particular, and that's the use of glyphosate as, a, as an herbicide. And those of you who are familiar with that will know what I'm talking about. Those of you who aren't, glyphosate is the active ingredient in Roundup, which is the big industrial uh, herbicide used in most commercial farming. And not only does it do, I mean, originally glyphosate was actually classified as an antibiotic. That was its original um, approval by the FDA, was as an antibiotic. So it kills bacteria in the soil. And what it, it also ends up doing is it kills bacteria in things like bees. So the microbiome of the gut in bees is being impacted and we're seeing the loss of bee species and populations because of the proximity to this herbicide. But it also does things like leach into, the, into our water supply. And then it does things like, we just learned this a, a little while before we got on the call today from a, another doctor who was talking about this. And she said that in somewhere like Flint, Michigan, they found that a problem with glyphosate in the water supply is that it actually chelates things like mercury and lead into the water from the pipes. So in other words, it pulls the water, uh, it pulls the toxic metal into the water supply and then we ingest it. Okay, so we have all of these things that are, I'm not saying this to panic you, by the way, okay? I, I don't wanna ever, you know, just make it sound like it's too scary for us to turn anything around. That's not, that's not why, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing if that's the case. Um, but what you have to do is change your approach. So when we're talking about these things, about how these interactions with pharmaceuticals affect your nutrients, like I said, we have to get back to this very basic approach of how are you building up your foundation? How are you making sure that you're taking care of that every day to the extent possible? Okay, so I want that, that idea to just sink in a little bit and then we'll, we'll talk about a few more of these specific things that you can watch out for. Um, so let's see, I think the oregano, how do we take it? Um, so obviously you don't want to take them in the oil capsule form. That's not, that is not what we recommend. You want to get the ones that's emulsified and they're more of a tablet form. And also you can, you know, you can let us know if you want to know what we use, but we're not here to advertise any of our supplements you, you we use. So we don't talk about it so much, but I wouldn't use the oil capsules, but get the tablets that's been emulsified and it's a slow release form. That's what you want so that, that they don't dissolve in your stomach, but they dissolve in your small intestine. That's the key with oregano because we're working with things like SIBO and small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So you don't want the oregano to dissolve in your stomach, then it doesn't do its job. They need to be intact until it approaches and then goes into the absorption area of the small intestine. That's, that's why we use the one that's emulsified and it's in a tablet form and it's slow release form. And you want to go back and forth with the probiotics and an oregano oil and then among other things too, like different herbs. And, you know, if you are wanting, wanting to use these herbs like oregano and olive, olive leaves and clove and other things, um, obviously you can use them in your cooking, yes, 
But if it's an acute issue and you want to work with it more of a um, medicinal level, then in just cooking into the food isn't going to do it. That is just more of a maintaining your health. You want to cook with a lot of herbs throughout your entire year. Um, and because of the soil depletion and because of increased you know, toxins in the air and glyphosate and things like that, just giving your land a year break isn't going to cut it, right? Because the studies are showing that the half-life of these glyphosate and these toxic substances that are sprayed all over the, the, the land, it's going to take more than our lifetime, triple, quadruple of our lifetimes to get sorted out. So just giving the land a little bit of break isn't going to do it. It's in the air, it's in the rain. Um, and, you know, like Chris said, and then did you say I was reading chat, so I didn't, I wasn't sure, but the glyphosate actually leaches. Um, yeah, I mentioned that. Yeah. So we're not even going down the heavy metals today yet. Okay, that just like, that's a huge rabbit hole. But so using herbs regularly v is very helpful. And I think we live in the era now that you can't really eat poorly anymore. You know, some people are like, I'm going to have a my cheat day or whatever that means, you know, or I'm just going to go nuts over the holidays and, you know, I'll come back to it. You know, good luck to that because body doesn't work like that any at all ever, but we're exposed to so much toxins and heavy metals and exhaustions and stressors just to just be here right now. I mean, let's get real. That is the reality, okay? We're not trying to be doomsday people here, but there's definitely, there's a lot of stressors that we're having to deal with. They're outside, inside, around, and all of the above. So you have to eat well. That That's just not uh, negotiable, you know, anymore. It's like people try to negotiate with me and say, oh, well, for this month, can I just, I'm like, you know what? I'm not you. You make the decision for yourself. But it's just, I think we pay the price when Chris and I go off on our diet, even for a day, we can feel the difference. So that sensitivity will go up because as the glass of water becomes clear, and more things are removed and we work on detoxing and nourishing ourselves often all the time, every day, then just a little bit, we pay for it because we notice it because the glass of water is much clearer than what it used to be. So we can see what poisons we're putting in there. But the fact is majority of people that the, we encounter, the glass of water isn't as clear. So they may not notice like, uh, another drop of, you know, gluten, you know, another drop of slice of bread isn't going to do it. And probably not because you're already not there. You're, you don't, you already don't see clearly. So, you know, in the world that the, I tend to work in, it's a little bit more spiritual world, the intuitive world, um, cosmic world, and people who want to channel and they want to become a medium. They want to be more intuitive. You know, I, I ask all of you, if you're, that's what you're very interested in, to clear the glass of your own water first. So when you are doing the intuitive work, you know it's a clear, you're the clear channel. That is your job. It's not, I think everybody's intuitive, okay? Everybody's got this gift of connecting with different energy fields. Um, I believe that because all of us as children, we were able to dream and visualize and see things. And we, you know, I know Chris had his own little girlfriend, uh, you know, when he was growing up that he would used to talk to imaginary friend, right? We all had those chances. So it's not that we don't have the abilities. It's just our vessel is not clear. So enough with that. And then I'm going to actually go into antidepressants because that's a big one too, SSRIs, right? Um, when you take things like Zoloft or Prozac or uh, some of these things have been recalled, but um, anti antidepressants, okay? And then if you take these long-term, certainly one of the things that the, we see often is that the depletion of essential fatty acids, okay? So essential fatty acids are so important for the brain function. 
So if you're starting to see yourself feeling like I'm having brain fog, you know, antidepressants I've been taking for decades, but, you know, seems to be having some cognitive issues with my brain, not just like a brain fog and forgetfulness, but you can't seem to think straight through your way or your mind cannot focus on things. And then you go and see a doctor. And I, I see this all the time. The In their 40s, they're getting prescriptions for ADD and ADHD medications. And they were on SSRIs, the antidepressants for you know 20 years. And then now they're having to add another medication, which is the more of a brain cognitive side of the medications. Well, you definitely want to supplement yourself with some fatty acids. So fish oil, my favorite is black currant oil, um, evening primrose oil, you may want to look in. So those are omega sixes. And you definitely want to make sure you're digesting fats and you're getting good saturated fats from animal fats. Um, and avocado fats, uh, walnuts fats, you know, th things like that. So oh, full spectrum from olive oil to avocado oil to fish oil to egg yolks to those are going to be very, very important. And what that means is that when you take SSRIs, a lot of the fat soluble vitamins are going to be deficient too, because you get these uh, nutrients from eating things like butter and so on and so forth. So vitamin D is going to be deficient, vitamin E, vitamin A, vitamin K. So those are some of the things you want to add back to. Um, B12 is a big one. And we see this a lot with, I would say, a lot of females that are very low on B12. So um, definitely you can, you can start to kind of see the trend that the B vitamins get used up a lot in the body. And when you take medications, B vitamins are the ones that are going to be depleted. And B vitamins are used not, not only by your different organs, but your liver loves them. And then your adrenals love, love, love your B vitamins. If your adrenals are fatigued and all the other things are going to start to break down. Um, B vitamins are necessary for your production of a neurotransmitter. So the very thing that, that you're trying to work on, like serotonin production, dopamine productions, GABAs, those get stifled by not having enough B vitamins. If you don't have enough B vitamins, you're going to have hormonal issues. Then you're going to be on a hormonal replacement therapy and so on and so forth. So, you know, I would... I highly, highly recommend you look into B vitamins. Folate is also important. So anything else, Chris, you want to add to that? Um, I think that just, yeah, just again, getting back to the, how do you get these into your diet also? I just want to reinforce that, that way of thinking instead of how many capsules or how many tablets of multi B complex, you know, supplements can I start to swallow to, you know, offset this effect? And so you want to make sure that, you know, if, if you are somebody that is taking this class of drug and you can see, I put some notes in the chat about uh, what Masami was saying, you want to really pay attention again to what are you eating? Are you eating, do you have animal protein in your diet? That's where a lot of the B vitamins are going to be sourced from. Leafy green vegetables, all those things that you hear people talking about like kale and broccoli and cauliflower, all those cruciferous green vegetables are high in these nutrients. Okay, so take a look at what you're eating also. There, there are several components to it. What are you eating? And how are you digesting it? Okay, those two things um, always need to be looked at. Um, There's some great questions coming in um, from Cheryl says, you know, is the balance between omega six and omega threes important? Absolutely. Okay, so if you do eat out, okay, and I mean, if you eat out even one meal that is cooked outside of your home, you're going to be overly exposed to omega-6, okay? The corn oil, soy oil, um, what, safflower oil, sunflower oil, uh, any seed oils, okay? Those are all cooked with omega-6s. So any liquidy oil, okay? And in restaurants, 
I maybe in places like California, you can find a places that will cook meals with coconut oil for you and ghee. But that's very cost ineffective, right? In terms of uh, if you're a restaurant owner, they're not going to spend the money cooking your meals with co or organic coconut oil and organic ghee because those are so expensive. So if you eat out, know that, that you are going to be exposing yourself to extra omega-6s, okay? Too much omega-6s plus sugar and plus like gluten and, you know, wheat products, that's going to throw off your body towards inflammatory cascade, okay? In this country, in the United States, we eat way too much omega-6s and not enough omega-3s. So we don't necessarily, I mean, we don't cook with corn oil, soy oil, all the GMO soy oil, uh, the, the oils, okay? Um, that doesn't mean you don't need omega-6. It just means you need more omega-3s and you need to be very careful about what kind of oil is this company, this restaurant cooking the food with. So there was this restaurant that we haven't been to for a decade now, um, but we called them up one time and said, hey, what kind of oil do you cook your food with? And it was like a fusion Asian food places that we were hoping we can go and eat and enjoy because we used to when we did not know better, right? Um, and they said, oh, we cook with the vegetable oil. And we're, we're like, okay, no, thank you. And then we just shut the, you know, uh, we, we, I guess nobody turn, uh, hangs up the phone like this anymore, but we hung up the phone um, because vegetable oil just means corn oil, soy oil, canola oil. Okay. So um, I get it that most of you would love to go out to a restaurant. You, you know, you would like to support the restaurant and so on and so forth, but um, we are very cautious about eating out because we will be overly exposed to that. And do you, Chris, remember the ratio, the actual ratio that the, we should be aiming for with that? I, I can't remember exact ratio. Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, there, there are different ranges given for different situations in your body, but it's somewhere between one to one and three to one of um, omega-3s to omega-6s that we're taking in as a supplement because the, the way our food is produced, like Masami said, we tend to already have a high um, omega-6 content, especially in, in meats that are raised in North America in particular. And so um, typically what our bodies need more of is omega-3 compared to omega-6. Um, um, and I'm just going to answer Melissa's question. It's like, what it, um, she's experiencing nausea when we take B vitamins. So I mentioned this on the last Monday, so I would recommend that the, you listen to that again, but it's basically, if your liver is unable to process things, you're going to feel nausea. Nausea is often liver associated. So what that means is the liver is congested, your bio is probably sludgy, and then you're unable to process the B vitamins. And once the liver operates better, you can take supplements and they will make you not feel that nauseous. But when it comes to B vitamins and particularly things like zinc, I would take them with food, right? so that they can get digested and broken down easily so they don't just get to duodenum area and then the, the liver has to like emulsify them and or they don't emulsify the B vitamins, but the liver still has to process it. So I would definitely take B vitamins with food. Okay. Quick answer for In Lynn. General. Lynn had a question about non-SSRI antidepressants like Wellbutrin. And it's basically the same list that we put up with a couple of additions. So it would be um, something like uh, CoQ10 would be a big one. And uh, that's a really important one because ironically, your brain needs CoQ10 in order to be healthy and to have a healthy mental state. And yet that's one of the things that's depleted when you're taking that, that sort of um, pharmaceutical. Another one, in addition to the B, the Bs that we mentioned, and folate, vitamin, uh, vitamin D, um, also B two, so that would be riboflavin, is something that uh, something like Wellbutrin would do, a non SSRI. Um, yeah, I would I would treat it the same in yeah. a way. Yeah. You know? 
Um, it, and the book that she mentioned, and I'm just going to say it, show it again. So if those of you that are very interested in finding out a little bit more about um, should you be taking the SSRIs, you know, antidepressants or some, some form of that, then I would highly recommend you read this, A Mind of Your Own. I'll put it up and, in the chat too. Yeah. And uh, the author is Kelly Brogan, MD. So that's what Lynn was talking about. And it's, it's well-written. It's a dense read. Um, but it's something that if you're serious about wanting to know what long-term use of SSRIs are doing to your system, I would definitely read that book and take your time reading it. Mm -hmm. There's a question way up at the beginning of the call from Susanna. She sent it to me privately, and I'm just going to answer here. She asked about the book that we were showing last week that had the... Um, synergist and antagonist relationships and uh, it's it's a little bit of a technical book i'll just say that right now the book is called trace elements but but it's not necessarily something i, I wouldn't i wouldn't recommend reading wouldn't, that book yeah i wouldn't no. recommend it as a as a casual read because it's like i said it's a fairly technical read that is the intended audience is people that are doing analysis of hair tissue mineral analysis labs so it's not it's not necessarily a general reading book. So it's, it wouldn't necessarily help to read it. Just something that you no, and uh, you can just look up mineral wheels. Yeah, or, mineral antagonists, mineral synergists. I'll type that up. Yeah, and then just the word wheel. You know, if you yeah. put that, you will see that picture. Okay, and Clemmy, yeah, you say brain injury can't cook, right? Um, so I only have takeouts. Um, Clemmy, you can get on those cooking groups, you know, what are, what are those things that they make foods that are already ready to just put it in the oven and warm it up and you can eat them and they serve you these amazing. And if any of you know the names of those companies that are out there, please type those in on the chat so Clemmy can look at it so that you don't have to do a take up because they do amazing things. They will cook certain foods for you. They will, you know, deliver them for you. And the only thing you need to do, and you can, I think, choose, you know, which level of cooking are you willing to do? And if it's none, except to warm it up, you can choose that. So you have ways to eat much, much, much better these days. Thank God to so many people that are becoming more aware of this. There's so. another, another question from Cheryl. Sorry, we missed that up at the beginning, Cheryl, about black seed oil to help with anti-inflammation. And um, I think we, we have to go around in talking about that. Do you know where I'm going with it, Chris? Yeah, why don't you? Because this is kind of like the same question as I'm having hot flashes. Should I be taking black cohosh? Mm -hmm. Um, so I hope you you can understand where I'm going with it, Cheryl, yeah. too. It's, it's basically is, do you think this bandaid works for this condition? And so why is that bandaid necessary? And why are you having to do that for your inflammation? Why are you inflamed? Where are you inflamed? Yeah. Um, you know, I know that black seed oil is great in terms of if it's work together to work with your heavy metal detox and things like that, it's, it's fine. But why are you not releasing your own heavy metals out of your body? Why are you having inflammation? So it becomes the same allopathic mindset. And some of you, I'm sorry, this is a total repeat of what I've been saying for a long time, but we can't use supplements as the replacement of your medication. You need to look at the your lifestyle, how you're eating, how you're digesting, how you're eliminating, what your thinking mind is like, what is your relationship with the spirits, um, what is your relationship that you have in your household, under your roof, um, many, many things you have to look at. And supplementing that with some of the nutrients are very important. But why do you continue to have inflammation? That's where you want to go. Why, you know, why am I having inflammation? So you need to go upstream to figure that. Okay. Yeah. I, I want to add to this. If too, it's yeah. a multi, multi aspect approach, 
I, you know, I don't get hung up on the black seed oil and I'm not quite sure why the black seed oil is coming in. So Cheryl, it's too, it's not enough information for me to tell you, is it good or bad? Because it's very bio-individual. I don't know why you're doing the black seed oil. I suspect it's something to do with the, maybe, you know, chelating or some kind of a heavy metal detox that you're doing. I don't know. So it's, it's hard for me to answer that question, but in general, is the black seed oil okay? Sure, you know, is it, but is it, you know, is it too much for you? Is it too little for you? I don't know. So it's really hard for me to answer that. I wanna just add on to that, that we hear a lot of buzzwords in the health industry. And I think if you're not educating yourself about what these things refer to and what they do, you can end up creating an imbalance unintentionally. So yeah, and Cheryl, I'm gonna, Cheryl, Cheryl just comment. Sorry, Cheryl. I saw that. I was going to comment because I saw the the comment come up and about the word chelating. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people will hear that chelation is something that's being done by some practitioners and assume it's a good thing for everybody, but it's not, and it's not good for all situations. In some some cases, in many cases, chelation is too harsh, too fast of a process for what your body is ready to do. And a lot of people that go through a chelation therapy often get sicker for a long period of time before they begin to recover from the chelation itself and what it's removing. And I wanted to say one other thing. There's this quote that um, it's, it's from Krishnamurti. Okay, it's a famous quote. And it's that it is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. Okay, it's no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. And we tend to be a sick society in the sense that we're always adapting what we do without looking at the causes of things and without looking at how our behaviors and our lifestyles and our diets are contributing to the factors. Instead, what we'll do is we'll say, well, I, I have inflammation, so I'm going to take this drug and that will reduce the inflammation. So that's a kind of adaptation, or I'm feeling this kind of pain, so I'm gonna take a painkiller. I'm having acid reflux, so I'm gonna kill it with an acid blocker. These are adaptations that we make, which aren't necessarily helping us, especially if our goal is ultimately to remove that condition. So we have to go back to the source of it. And, and with that, I'm gonna let Masami close us off with final thoughts, because we're reaching the end of our time. And yes, I will type up that quote in the chat. Well, Lynn said, um, Sunfair, S-U-N-F-A-R-E in California, um, they must do the food service. So please look into that and Clemmy, look into that and see if you could start to order because the the price I bet you is maybe equivalent to getting, you know, takeouts or even be cheaper. You know, I mean, certainly it would be, highly a lot more beneficial to your health okay to have these wonderful organic foods be delivered to you okay um one thing that i wanted to mention about the chelation okay so i feel like the chelation is such buzzwords and i thought that buzzword will go away like a year ago but it seems to like resurge again in the spring it's like a chelation time or something like that but i want all of you to know our philosophy Chris and I have our own philosophy in addressing people's health after years and years of working with people is that you have to take care of the foundation of you before you can start to, you know, decorate the house. That's one. So foundation means what's on your plate. Are you eating the right kind of thing? Are you sitting down and making sure that the, your nervous system is on the parasympathetic side? So fight, not a fight or flight, but rest and digest. And are you chewing? And, you know, energetically, are you here? Are you fully here? Right. So for those of you that are taking my 7B, the, the anatomy of cosmic flow, I've been teaching you all kinds of tools to come back to this body. That is the key. Are you in your body when you're consuming foods that will become who you are? Okay. That's. That's an important idea. External foods you eat will eventually become who you are. That's an incredible step that we're taking every single day for most of us three times a day, minimum, okay? So 
That's one. And then number two is that we want to support your liver and your gallbladder and making sure that the, your small intestine can absorb the nutrients and you can poop out the things you don't need. Okay. So elimination pathways are open. That's number one. Are you breathing? Are all your elimination organs operating? And are they moving things out? Before you start to go and say, I'm going to start doing chelation, I'm going to do heavy metal detox, I'm going to do this and that. It's like I work with a handful of people right now who have been injured by doing so much chelation. There's one lady that has been bed rested for the last two years and she finally found me. We're slowly working on things, okay, extremely baby steps right now, but that's because she's done so much chelation, so much of detox that it started to recirculate through in her entire system. So she actually toxified herself by doing that. So there's step by step that, that you want to approach with this. Okay. Um, so please, if you hear the words like you need to detox and you got to chelate your heavy metals, just pause for a moment, get back into yourself. Is this the right direction for me? And in, uh, in my course, I'm teaching how to test with your own body. So come back, ask yourself, is this the right approach for me right now? Okay. There's a time and place for chelation. I get that. But most of the time when we work with the clients, we don't even have to take them through that heavy metal detox chelation because the body starts to move, body starts to work and the body will do its own job. So trust a little bit more. Um, come home a little bit more, connect with yourself a little bit more. Okay. All right. So I think that's, that's all I got. Chris, do you want to say, I think you started it, so you should end it today. I was just going to say amen to that. <laughs> yeah, all right. No, I, I think, I think that's, that's enough said on, on this topic for our, for our hour and a little bit today. But um, yeah, everyone just, I, I would just send you out with the thought of start out by being kind, see if you can just listen a little bit more each day and develop that sense of trust. Okay. It really does come back to that. When you start to develop that, your life is going to transform in ways that you cannot possibly even comprehend. Okay. It's an amazing thing when you reach that stage of being able to trust your own body. So patience, baby steps, and just do your best to listen a little bit better today than you did yesterday. Okay. That's all I've got for today. All right. Well, thank you everyone. And we'll, oh, uh, I forgot everyone. I have a free like interview tomorrow that I posted on my, um, I put it on my email. So please take a look and we'll put it on the YouTube too, but it's called soul talk and I'll be getting interviewed tomorrow live. So um, call in if you want to listen and hopefully you can raise your hands there too and then ask me questions. So hopefully we'll see you there. Okay. You can and we'll find out, you. you can also find out more on masamikavi.com. That's always oh, where you can go for information. So it's in the events section on the homepage. You welcome everyone. You welcome. We'll Thanks see you for next, being here. See you next Monday. See you.